1981, I was in college, and uh, they did in a year, a bunch of us drove across Cedar Maples, and we saw a sign that said Grand Gulch. We went, oh, what's that? And a year later, we took off and went down into Grand Gulch. At the time, we had absolutely no idea what was there. And you can imagine, if any of you guys had been in there, you know, it changed our lives. And so here I am talking to you guys about uh, some of the artifacts that came out of there. Um, <coughs> Just sort of echoing Phil Lyman, uh, last fall I was on Chrome Ridge with Winston Hurst looking across towards Cedar Mesa and I made the comment that San Juan County is probably the most spectacular county in North America. And Winston, being exuberant that he is, <laughs> said, um, I'd agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'd, I'd like to thank Lori for the opportunity I've had to uh, uh, look at these artifacts and, and see this wonderful stuff. That, it came out of the folks that call this landscape home, and of course the funding uh, entities that, that made it all possible. Um, about ten minutes. Um, I want to go over three things. One of the preferred feather blankets we looked at. Laura has talked about uh, those in the past. Uh, what what strikes me um, are the small the small group. Well. It appears, and I'm not sure this at all, it's all speculation, but possibly prior to the advent of agriculture, before people settled down, maybe their main winter blankets were made out of cottontails and jackrabbits. Um, and then it appears they came through a period where they used a lot of small birds, and finally when turkey husbandry came along, you know, the small bird use sort of dropped off. Uh, so the take home message is for the small bird blankets, they were, had, they were getting small ground feeding birds. Um, primary, primary, <coughs> primarily among those would have been dark-eyed juncos, and I don't know if anybody here is the birds, but dark-eyed juncos are, are a very abundant winter resident on Cedar Mesa, southeastern Utah, all across the Colorado Plateau. Um, I don't know if they're the smartest birds in the woods, um, and I, I, I think you see that reflected in them being converted into blankets. Um, uh, in, interestingly, um, uh, they were they were probably used captured for food uh, by the Hopis and maybe other Pueblo groups right up into the 1900s. I get the impression they may have come in around the villages. If you have a, a sedentary uh, village situation, you may have these birds coming in, feeding on bits of grain, little bits of food. They're real confiding species. Um, the second thing I want that, that I was struck by were the possibilities of trade. Uh, in, in, in mammals and, uh, uh, in the Four Corners. Some of you, probably most of you, have heard of a site in Sagi Canyon called Woodchuck Cave. Uh, this is a, a basket maker site that was excavated in the mid-1930s by um, Clay Lockett and Lyndon Hargrave as part of the Rainbow Bridge Monument Valley Expeditions. It's called Woodchuck Cave because they found this, a number of mandibles of, a, of, of what they were calling woodchucks. Now, in the eastern United States, the woodchuck is, is a type of marmot, um, marmota, monax, or some such thing. In the west, in Utah, Colorado, um, and further north, is an animal called the yellow-bellied marmot. And sometimes these are called rock chucks. Um, but that's what these jawbones were. There are no woodchucks or no, no marmots in Arizona today. And I know um, when I check the range maps, there's no marmots found in southeastern Utah. They're found up in central Utah and um, uh, in, the, in the southwestern Colorado. And I was immediately struck um, when, it, when, I, when I read this that, well, wait a minute, these might have been traded in possibly from southeastern, or excuse me, southwestern Colorado. And it made me wonder if these represented some sort of trade relationships with the so-called uh, Eastern basket maker groups. Um, you know, and marmots, a, you know, a marmot would make a wonderful purse. They're a, they're a big animal with a really thick hide. You can, you could, uh, this thing probably last you 20 years. Um, and I don't know what you do with the jaws, make jewelry out of them. But on the last day in this, at the Smithsonian with Lori in, in January, I was looking through some of the items I had didn't have a chance to look at. I was just looking at the trays of stuff she'd gone through. And lo and behold, I think I saw a marmot skin. Uh, I was struck. I was struck by that. Um, didn't have time to confirm it, but again, if marmot jaws end up in northern Arizona, um, why not one uh, skin one end up in Utah, uh, southeastern Utah? Um, the other thing that really was a surprise last year 
was in a, um, a, a Lang and Lyman collection, was a, a large black piece of hide listed as a uh, bear skin. And I was looking at this thing going, man, I can't turn this into a bear. It doesn't have a long, shiny guard hairs. And it had this thick, wooly undercoat uh, coat to it. And I kept thinking bison, bison, bison. I made a trip up to the University of Utah, and I saw that they had a mounted bear in a glass case and a buffalo. <laughs> stand there and, and um, boy, you know, I just went, I still think this is, my mind just kept going back to bison. Finally, last fall, a friend of mine calls me up and says, Chuck, let's go to Wyoming and shoot a buffalo. And so we went up there and he's got shot a buffalo. The first thing I did was look this thing over and I'm absolutely convinced that this was a buffalo skin blanket uh, that came from right over here, um, believe it, Allen Canyon. And um, that, to me, suggests trade as well. I was talking with Winston last night. He thought maybe bison had been known from the San Juan Basin in Mexico. I haven't had a chance to check this out. Possibly they came down um, from the north. I know there's, I think, bison um, moccasins from Promontory Cave, I believe. So this, both of these, the, wood, the, the woodchuck and the, and the bison suggest trade connections to the north, and to me, I'm always hearing about trade connections to the south uh, with shell and that sort of thing. So I thought the, uh, that was pretty interesting. Um, the other, other thing that was really striking to me were the compound agricultural implements that we kept running across. Um, we've all heard of, of uh, chamahias and how there, some of these stone blades have been attached, hafted to wooden handles. And we've also seen um, horn um, that were attached, uh, big horn sheep horn blades attached to wooden handles. And um, well, about two years ago I was online and I was looking at the collections of photos posted online from floating house on Chinle Wash and there were these couple of wooden looking spades with short handles. And I thought, you know, maybe they just held all of these by hand. Well, it, now it appears that compound tilling instruments were real common and they seem to have a specific shape in the way these things were attached. Um, and when I started becoming aware of this at the Smithsonian, I thought, you know, maybe what they did is if you can't find a large piece of, of, of hard wood that's durable to work in the ground, you would find a smaller piece, you'd have that onto a lighter handle. And as I was walking past, past these trays, I kept seeing these longer, these compound instruments. I thought, I bet you that one's going to have a willow handle. And when I finally got to it, it was just really light wood. So um, I guess the take home message is there is that, that these, in addition to the, 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 the as you call them, self, self tools, they're all one piece, they're also making these compound tools with harder, harder um, pieces of wood. That, it's like a compound dark four shafts where they would have a lighter main shaft and, and some more durable point. Um, in that regard, to me, one of the most spectacular implements uh, that I've seen with Lori was a um, uh, compound um, uh, tilling stick with you know nice straight wooden handle. This beautifully worked um, bighorn sheep horn. This thing looked like it had never been used. I often thought it was I found it sitting at some cliff dwelling by Weatherall, I believe. And it makes me wonder, was this the last tool made on Cedar Mesa before it was abandoned? Um, I've got like 30 seconds. Seems to be a good one. Um, uh, Lori mentioned we saw a, a number of um, strange, uh, they almost looked like draw knives. They were, uh, you see them, a few other script, uh, published reports of them. They're, they're, they're obviously drawn. Um, held by two hands with a beveled, highly polished uh, interior curve. Winston and I were talking about them and wondering if they were both the working hides. Um, I think Kidder and Guernsey found something like that as well. Um, also, we see a lot of greasewood used. Um, that might be the toughest wood around. The stuff is brittle. I swear you could nap it if you, if you had to. Um, but you see it on digging sticks. We've seen it in dark four shafts. We've seen it in arrow four shafts. And, uh, we saw three wedges made out of this stuff. And I've, I've got some in my car. I've been just hoping to make some of this stuff and play with it and see how it works. So.